Hi everyone! Thanks for joining once again the Everything MRI community. Today we continue our discussion about the SAR, which is the topic we have introduced in the last video. If you missed it, just click on the link in the description below. Now, at this point, we should have a knowledge what the SAR is and what are the initial considerations to make in order to avoid potential SAR conflicts. Now is the time to explore what are the different MR parameters to manipulate that can allow us perhaps to avoid those conflicts and therefore try to reduce the overall SAR level. As we have seen in the first part of this educational content, this is a classic example of a SAR conflict that the machine might display. Some scanners simply employ a certain number of breaks within the examination in order to allow the patient to dissipate the heat generated. Others, like for instance the one we are using, they provide directly the MR tech with some means to continue scanning prior, however, altering some specific MR parameters. In particular, as we can see, the machine requires the manipulation of either the number of slices, the TR or the flip angle. This, this last parameter, in my opinion, is the first to take into consideration to get rid of these conflicts and avoid potential disruption in the workflow. And why is that? I got here some proofs to reinforce my argument. So when we talk about the flip angle, we refer to that angle at which the spins of protons are tipped away from their equilibrium state by a radio frequency pulse. Normally, the energy deposition increases with the square of the flip angle, and therefore a 180 degree RF pulse, like the one we used here to produce the left image, deploys four times more energy than a 90 degree pulse, for instance. This is why, in most cases, lowering the degree of the flip angle is a sufficient action to bypass most of the SAR conflicts. Any drawback in doing this? Let's analyze it together. So we are evaluating here the image quality of a coronal T1 sequence of a NIP scan acquired with different flip angle. And you can see that even zooming closer to the ape, it's quite difficult to spot major differences in the image quality between the two sequences. Multiple comparisons were made in the past by some fellow colleagues and most of them involved the use of a region of interest to compare the noise level between two images acquired with different flip angles. And overall the outcome underlying has been basically always the same, meaning a slight reduction in the signal to noise ratio when a lower flip angle was used. Nevertheless, the impact of this is clearly not as such to render the image non-diagnostic or significantly less appealing to the eyes of a radiologist. And I would say that this is also confirmed by the example that we are seeing here at the moment. There are in fact no crucial differences in the image quality between the XLT2 acquired with a 180 degree flip angle and the one acquired a 120. Don't you think so? I would suggest you leave a comment in the video below and let me know your thoughts about it. But in my opinion, I think they look, they look pretty much the same, to be honest. And similar result here, acquiring PD FATSAT sequences with different flip angle there are some very mild differences on the image quality and probably in terms of image contrast, but overall the benefits of lowering the flip angle for the purpose of reducing the SAR level significantly outweigh, in my opinion, this potential minor drawbacks. But again, I'm curious here to know your opinion, so just please leave me a feedback here in the comments below. Sometimes, nevertheless, decreasing the degree of the flip angle might not be a possible option, and the scanner might force us to consider alternative pathways, like for instance altering the TR or limiting the number of slices. And here we need to start to be a little bit more careful. Like in this example, where the machine is asking us to double the TR, namely doubling the interval of time between two consecutive radio frequency pulses. Can we actually do this without major consequences on our images? The answer is maybe, but there are several things to consider. 
Firstly, increasing the TR could significantly increase the scan time, and therefore the sequence could be more affected by potential motion artifacts. Secondly, we might indirectly affect the weighting itself of the sequence. In this example, we are seeing two XLT1, one acquired with a TR of 700 milliseconds, and the other one with a TR of 1400 milliseconds. There is a long-lasting debate about which are the correct values for the TR of a T1 sequence. For how I see it, this should fall into a range between 400 and 700 milliseconds at 1.5 Tesla. As a result, with a TR of 1400 milliseconds, we are largely exceeding this acceptance threshold and perhaps we are starting approaching another type of weighting, which is the proton density. Now, these images have been acquired at 3 Tesla, which gave us a little bit more freedom in extending the value for the TR. However, some minor differences can be spotted already, like for instance, there is a slight change in the signal of the bladder and the muscles surrounding the ape. So be very, very careful when considering overcoming these conflicts playing with the TR. Especially because sometimes you might have conflicts like this one, where the scanner requires a four-fold increase in the TR value to continue scanning. Obviously, such change would considerably boost the differences in the weighting of the sequence, something we really want to avoid. An alternative option might be reducing directly the number of slices. According to the pathology to investigate, we can consider limiting the slices, preserving at the same time a similar scan coverage, and this can be done by adopting a thicker slice thickness and a greater distance factor, or probably better known as gap. This additionally will be beneficial from a SNR perspective, since there will be more protons contributing to the image formation. The drawbacks of this action are a reduction on, in the spatial resolution as we are basically performing the sequence with a larger voxel size. And also you might find some difficulties in matching the same anatomical coverage. What I mean is we might end up with having an XLT2 originally obtained with a slice thickness of 3 mm just to give you an example, while the respective XLT1 will be later acquired a 4 or 5 mm to avoid a sudden SAR conflict. And better to keep in mind that this mismatch might not be ideal for the purpose of reporting a scan. If none of what we have evaluated so far works in your favor and you're still stuck with a SAR conflict, there might still be a couple of things that are worth to try. The next one, for example, will allow you to address the source of the problem straight away. And I'm talking about changing the RF pulse type. This parameter defines the length and the form of a radio frequency pulse. Switching from fast to normal or even low SAR would change the slice profile, ensuring greater efficiency as far as the SAR is concerned. Pay attention to that some of the parameters, as we are seeing at the moment, might be consequently altered as a result of such variation, especially TR and TE. Usually, when manipulating the RF pulse type for SAR reduction purposes, we also consider a potential alteration in the gradient mode. The gradient mode determines, determines the rise time and the maximum gradient strength that is used to switch gradients when a sequence is acquired. When FAST is activated, the gradient rise time is fully utilized and this might end up causing peripheral nerve stimulation to the patient. Normal, instead, the one that we just selected now, represents a much better compromise between noise and performance, and this is usually the one recommended by the vendor for decreasing SAR conflicts. In the same tab, there is another parameter that plays a crucial role in this game, namely the turbo factor. Turbo spin echo sequences use a significant number of 180 degree refocusing pulses applied over a short period of time, and this has detrimental consequences on the SAR release in the patient body tissues. Reducing the turbo factor can be beneficial in this sense, not only to decrease the overall SAR level, but also to minimize the acquisition of blurred images. 
The main disadvantage, as we can see, is a negative impact on the scan time, which might gradually increase the more we reduce the turbo factor, like in this case. In fact, now that this parameter has been reduced to 10, the sequence lasts over 4 minutes, while initially, with a greater turbo factor, the scan time was just around a couple of minutes. A good idea might be considering alternating sequences characterized by high turbo factors, like Turbo Spin Echo, with sequences which have a relatively small impact on the SAR, like for instance the DWI. This is a classic example of a prostate protocol where we have multiple high SAR sequences. Reordering the protocol might allow us to cope with those bothering SAR conflicts. Even if I have to tell you that I recognize the fact that most of the time this might not be ideal from a workflow perspective. So now we have reached the stage. My question for you is, are you still stuck with a SAR conflict? If yes, I might have a final tip to share with you. This is usually not particularly discussed in books or in the material provided by the EMR vendor, but I'm pretty sure you might find it useful to sort out most of the most of your problems related to the SAR. And I'm talking about suspense, getting rid of the SAT band. I know the SAT band uh, is useful for multiple reasons, including improving the image quality, reducing the number of artifacts, and so on. However, it has an impact from a SAR perspective. I saw many times multiple MR protocols saved with the SAT bands in some weird positions with no specific advantage, uh, but probably the only drawback of increasing the SAR level. If you think that the SAT band is not really necessary in that position, just remove it. This will, this will reduce the SAR and will allow you to continue scanning if you have a SAR conflict. And this is the end of the second part about SAR reduction techniques. I hope you think that the topic has been addressed in a pretty comprehensive way. Again, if you missed the introductory part, please just use the link below and watch the video. If you want to provide us a feedback, just leave a comment below. Our passion is moved from the fact that we always want to learn more about MRI and we are literally open to any suggestion that will allow us to improve. Last thing, do not forget to subscribe to the channel and follow Everything MRI on our social media platforms. As usual guys, we'll see you around.